Hi, everybody. It's morning here. I don't know what it is where you are, but wherever it is, I hope you're doing well. Uh, I'm going to speak to you this morning about uh, the achievement habit, which is the title of a book I just wrote. And uh, basically, it's, it's, it, we're phrasing this morning as a guide to you as a doer. And what I mean by a doer and what I mean by achievement is a little bit unusual. I don't mean becoming king of the universe, and I don't mean uh, necessarily uh, doing extraordinary things. I mean doing your life in a way that's supportive of whatever your purposes are. And so I'm really talking to everybody, no matter how you, 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 you think of yourself. So uh, let's get started. Um, I'm making an assumption. I'm assuming that your behavior and your relationships can be transformed. And uh, that assumption is valid if you want to do it. It's not valid if you don't want to do it. And I also uh, want to know that you can choose to create habits that make your life better. So that underlines what the basis of what I'm going to tell you is about. Uh, and I'm going to use something called design thinking. And design thinking is a process for behavioral change that can be used to, for transformation. That's the way I'm going to think of it. Now, there are lots of ways of, of, of portraying this. Uh, this is a, one of the standard ways we use. Uh, the first step is if you're going to solve a problem or do something is to empathize with what the, whoever it is you're designing for or whoever it is you're solving for. If it's for yourself, you have to sort of empathize for you, with yourself. The next idea is to define whatever the issue is you're trying to deal with and then to generate ideas and then to prototype your solutions and ultimately to test them. Now, I've drawn this in this funky way because it is not a linear process. We use it as a linear way to teach people, but in fact, in reality, it never kind of works that way. And at any point, any one of these boxes can appear anywhere else. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing I want to really emphasize, in my mind, the, the main important thing is this plus D mindsets, which means that there are mindsets that go with this. It's not just a matter of a bunch of tools and you just go through by the numbers. And uh, the mindsets are very important. There's also other ways to portray these, and uh, here's another set that is used sometimes, uh, where we, we sort of break up the first two into three things. So we have understanding first, then we have observe, and then we have we form what's called a point of view. And this kind of reflects back, if you want to just go back for a second to the previous one, what we've done is we just take an empathize and define and broken it into three steps. The, the last three are the same in both diagrams. The nice thing about this diagram, there are all these lines going every which way, again, emphasizing it's not a linear process, and it emphasizes this whole idea of empathy for whoever you're working with as being the, heart, the, the root of the whole process. But to me, the most important thing are not those boxes at all. It's the idea of what I call the mindsets. And one of the mindsets which is really important is what we call human-centered. And I'll, I'll give you examples later on to make it clear just how this applies. And the other thing which is really important is what we call a bias towards action. And that is not thinking things to death before you move, but once you have an inkling of where you want to go, you move. And we know you're going to do something wrong. We know you're going to fail. And to learn how to profit from that so that you actually move ahead more quickly, ultimately, even though you have to take a few steps backwards. We also have the idea of radical collaboration. Uh, we're not in this alone. And even on your own personal issues, you're not in it alone. And if you learn how to use other people, you're twice as strong as if you did it all on your own. Uh, we have a culture of prototyping, which is just trying stuff out. And with that, we have what we call show, don't tell. In other words, just don't tell. Let's do something about it. Don't just give me your ideas about it. And all the time, be mindful of your process. If you're mindful of your process, you can keep changing and you can keep improving it. So these are kind of the tools and the background we're going to bring into play in dealing with our issues. And uh, I want to uh, give you an example of what I call a human-centered approach to derive a point of view, which is essentially getting a problem statement. And uh, formally speaking, it can take many, many different forms. But the form that I think makes the most sense is you start with a phrase describing a specific user. 
and it's usually a noun phrase. It's a person, a name of a person, or a type of person. Then there's a verb phrase specifying a need. What does you want to do? And then the key is an insight, a phrase giving an insight specifying what, but not how, the solution needs to be accomplished. To be concrete, here's a specific, oh, too many slides ahead. Here's an example. So an example of a point of view or problem statement might be a poor single mother needs financial know-how so she can use her money efficiently. So the insight implied in this point of view is that poor single moms lack enough financial know-how to use their money efficiently. If this is not valid, even a large increase in her financial know-how might not produce a more efficient use of, for, of funds. So it's important that the P of U reflect the person's actual need for a solution. Okay, so that's, that's an example of, of, of a type of thing we're talking about. And you can, working on your own problems, you can phrase them in terms of a point of view. Now what happens is that we get stuck. We have a problem, we get stuck. All of us lose sleep working on problems in our minds. You have problems from work, you have problems in your life, you have problems with your family, you have problems with your coworkers. Uh, you, your life is full of problems. That's the human situation. And most of us are smart enough to get them done every day. You got to, the, you got to this webinar, I got here. Uh, Assumedly, you dress properly or improperly for wherever you are. You, you you eat enough food. Most of us solve a million problems a day, and we never think about it. But every once in a while, we get stuck. And very bright people get stuck. The brightest people I know get stuck. And I've noticed over the years that the odds are that what you the reason you're stuck is that you're treating a wrong answer as a right question. In other words, you don't really have a question. You think you have a question, but you really have chosen an answer, and it's not something you can implement. So you bang your head against this thing, which is just the wrong-headed thing to do. And if you understand that, you can get unstuck. And the question is how? How could you think you could get unstuck? Well, I have one method I want to tell you about uh, that I write about that's actually works very, very well, and it's very simple. There are many methods, and I talk about those, but the one that I think is, is the one most worth knowing about and easiest to apply is the following. So let's take an example. Let's say you want to find a spouse, and nothing works. You've gone on the Internet. You've, gone, you've been introduced by various people. You've gone to every pickup joint you know, et cetera, et cetera, and just nothing works. So you have a problem, and you're losing sleep over this problem. So what I would say is ask yourself, what would it do for you if you found a spouse? So if you solved your problem, what would it do for me? Now, there are many answers. Let's say, for example, your answer is that you want companionship. So you want to find a spouse in order to get companionship. So now forget about finding a spouse. The problem, the real problem you want to work on is getting companionship. So if you look at that problem, immediately your solution space has opened up tremendously. So in addition to finding a spouse as a possible solution, you might meet friends online, you might take classes, you might get a pet, you might join a club, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you have this vast solution space, and often at this point you get unstuck. You just look at the problem. And in, it, it, it will turn out, if you had a hard time here, it will turn out probably if you found a spouse, it wouldn't work, you wouldn't have companionship. For example, my wife of only 60 years keeps complaining, I'm never home. She, I don't give a companionship. Here I am talking to you instead of being home with making breakfast for her. So she made a bad mistake, okay? Don't make the same mistake, okay? And this opens it up, and it's just so simple. So this method is simply, if you're stuck, ask yourself, what would it do if you got unstuck? What would it do if you solved your problem for you? And that becomes your new problem. And often, your original problem disappears. Now, the thing that you have to understand, and a lot of people, especially Stanford undergrads, have problem understanding is that disappearing a problem is much better than solving it. If a problem disappears in your life, it's gone, usually forever. If you solve it, it can come back to bite you. So in my previous example, finding a spouse is gone forever. 
if you find companionship some other way. And you don't have to worry about it. It's never going to come back. You don't have to worry about divorces. You don't have to worry about getting married six times. You can just go on with your life and have your companionship in every good way. And this holds with more serious problems, although that may be a very serious problem for you. But this holds in any kind of problem. Usually, you, you let go of the first problem because it's meaningless to you and you find a new problem. So I'm going to give you a few examples that, that have occurred in my work at the D School, and, and, uh, and then we'll get back to tools that you can use. So this is a prop. This shows a uh, water pump, a treadle water pump that some students designed for Myanmar. We've sold over 80,000 of them, and uh, it's been very successful. But what happens is uh, the uh, people in Myanmar decide they want bigger and bigger pressure heads, so they kept raising these pumps higher and higher off the ground. And they were often the children using it, and it got scarier and scarier and scarier to see them. So the problem was, how do we uh, get the people up there in a safe way? And then someone said, well, what, would, what could we do? Why would I do that? And they rephrased the problem, and the solution becomes uh, leave, leave the people on the ground. And here's the solution that they found, is they put the pump way up here, they actually made out of plastic, out of metal, and they made a bicycle chain all the way up and down, and the mother can sit on the ground and pump, or treadle away all day, and they got a bigger pressure head. So it just reframed the problem. Another example, uh, in a grosser way, also involved the pump. One of the teams went, one of the early teams went to uh, Myanmar to work on water pumps, and while they were in the farmer's huts doing empathy work, they they noticed that it was very hard to breathe because the farmers were uh, using kerosene lamps and candles for lights and task lighting. And they found out that it was, uh, A, the kerosene was very expensive. It consumed about 20 percent of the farmer's meager income. And secondly, it was toxic. So they figured, look, it, it won't do anything if we get these people water if they're going to get sick and all that. The real problem is how do we get these people healthy task lighting? So they went and designed uh, LED lights with uh, solar power, and they've sold millions of them now by finding the right, the useful problem to deal with. Uh, another example, which is sort of iconic in the D School, is an NGO from um, from Nepal came, and they had these incubators for premature children, which are essentially the same as we have in the hospitals at Stanford. They cost around $20,000, and they need electricity all the time, and they have a lot of parts. And in Myanmar, they were breaking, and the, the, they were having, finding it hard to maintain them, and the, the supply of electricity is intermittent. So there were these two issues, uh, and the students started to work on the problem by making less parts, uh, redesigning it so it wouldn't be as complicated, and putting battery backups there. And when the students went, actually went to Nepal, they found that, in fact, uh, this was the team for, for hapless Stanford students, and, and they were very motivated because there was over 20 million low birth weight children each year and 450 die each hour. So that's a strong motivator. And when they went there, they found that, the, that, the, that they had the wrong problem because what they, would, they found is that there were desperate pro parents in remote villages who cannot access a major hospital. So this, even if these incubators worked, the people who needed them couldn't get to them. So what they needed was something that gives their dying babies a chance to survive. So they redefined the problem and came up with something which looks like, uh, this is various prototypes, uh, that looks like a sleeping bag. And inside it, they put a bladder of a wax-like material that when you heat it up, it changed phase. and it kept the temperature for about four and a half, five hours. It kept exactly the body temperature you want. So you can heat this bladder by electricity if you have it, but you could also do it with boiling water or many other means you can to warm it. And that kind of solved the problem by reframing it of not how do you fix the incubators or keep the incubators warm, but how do you keep the babies warm, which is the real problem. And even if you solve the problem to fix the incubators, 
it still wouldn't have solved the problem of keeping the babies warm because the babies couldn't get to the incubators. So it gets this whole idea of being stuck with the wrong solution. And now they, they're selling these things all over the world. They're giving them away. And they've, they're up to something like 60,000 babies already. But the, the, the other thing I want to point out, this is sort of, you don't have to read this, but it's a sort of a graph uh, of the uh, timeline on this project. And what I want you to see is they started, in, the team started on this problem in January 2007, and they weren't really launched and all that until 2011. So everyone thinks, well, I got a great idea and that's it. Well, folks, I got bad news for you. That happens very, very rarely. There's something that goes between the great idea and getting it out there, and that's called hard work. And that's the biggest creativity tool in the world, hard work. And something called intention to do what you want to do and giving it attention. I'll get back to that later. So uh, in, addition, uh, in addition to designing this, it turns out that they noticed, some friend of these students noticed that uh, there were a lot of children being born uh, where they needed, you need to shine blue lights on their, on, on their eyes in order for them not to have brain damage and stuff like that. And people were shining white lights on them. So again, it's, it was so outrageous that uh, people realized uh, the designs that they have where you can put in a fluorescent light which is white or, or, uh, or blue is causing jaundice in parts of the world where people are just replacing blue light bulbs with white light bulbs, not understanding they're not solving the problem. So once we understood the real problem was uh, how do you prevent that, it's simple. You just make uh, LEDs, uh, blue LEDs. So these kinds of things, the solutions become simple once you realize what the right problem is. Uh, we do some exec ed work in the D school, and I'll just mention two of those, and then we'll go back to our main topic of what you can do. Uh, so this happened with JetBlue, was a very popular company in the beginning, and then they were actually going to be on Business Week as the fourth best company in, in America in terms of customer relations and things like that. And then what happened is it was a huge snowstorm, and their airplanes got kind of stranded on the runways. They lost control of where the planes were, so they just shut everything down, and people were entrapped in the planes for years. And this caption said, is this your first flight with JetBlue showing people on a prison? And uh, it was a disaster for the company, and they tried to work their way around it, and they hired high-level consultants. And this woman, who, had, who is a Stanford graduate and an Olympic athlete, uh, and is the head director of airport planning, thought that, you know, what they have to use is sort of the D school idea of empathy and bring together the various uh, groups. And so she went to management and said, look, I don't need any money. I just need uh, two weeks of, of, of one or two pilots, one or two co-pilots, one or two navigators, one or two baggage handlers, one or two. I need from each of the company's constituencies one or two people, and I need a big room. And she used this whole idea of people for the first time talking to each other across their boundaries within the company and realizing how they could each support each other and each needs. And essentially, she solved the problem and became a big heroine. But it had to do with this whole idea of empathy, which is you have to talk to the people you're designing for. You have to talk to the people you're working for. And another classic example of that, and this will be my last example, uh, came from Doug Dietz, who is a uh, longtime designer at GE Medical, and he designed MRI machines, and uh, <clears throat> he was horrified to find out <clears throat> that children have to be sedated at the rate of about 85 percent to go into the machine. And what he realized uh, is that he had never applied any empathy for the children. He did not look at the machine from a child's point of view. From a child's point of view, an MRI machine is a horrible monster. And you're asked to crawl into this metallic thing into the mouth of it, and it scares them. Actually, my wife also gets data when she goes into one of those machines. So a lot of people are scared about her, and they're noisy. And children are horrified by it. So what he did, when he got that realization, he went back to where he works, and he got uh, to talk to children who are chronic patients. He went to children's museums. He went to child psychologists. And he tried to see the whole thing from the point of view of the user, 
namely these children. And what they did is they didn't touch the machines at all. They just reframed the experience. And here you can see what they did is they painted it as an adventure ride. So one was a pirate ship, and you have to hold still so the pirates don't see you. Another was going to camps. So you have to hold still to see the stars. And the day before, he sent them a booklet explaining looking through the body and all of that in a knapsack like you were going to camp, and it became an adventure. So they reframed, and that's a very good tool, reframe your problem. He reframed the problem from how do you uh, d d d how do you deal with this medical procedure into how do you make an adventure out of this thing. And it, it worked so well that the sedation rate dropped to close below 5%. I think it's something like 3% in the group he looked at. And also, children were heard saying, Mommy, Mommy, can we come back tomorrow? So he totally changed this thing from a negative experience to a positive experience simply by getting empathy and reframing the problem. So another thing I want to just show you is an example of bias towards action. So what we mean by bias towards action is uh, we have a class called Launchpad, and um, right in the first class, this, these two fellows came. Here's one of them. Uh, and they had this idea of making a newsreader on an iPad. And the iPad uh, had just come out, and these students had nowhere to work, so they worked in cafes. And everyone wanted to try the iPad. So they were able to get immediate feedback all day long on their, uh, their app, which was a newsreader, a sort of pictorial newsreader. And they could change their coding several times a day. So they made very quick progress. And after the third week in the class, the professor said, launch. And they said, no, no, we're not ready. It's not perfect. And they said, launch or get out of the class. So they launched and immediately sold 20,000 apps at $4 each in those days. And Steve Jobs gave them a shout out. And they took off. And just about two years ago, they sold the company for $90 million to LinkedIn. So it's a really big success story. But the main point about that is the bias towards action. The bias towards action was they would keep working. If they were taking this class in the business school, they'd probably still working on it, getting it perfect before they would take it out. And you have to move forward even though you know it's not perfect because you're going to learn from, you, from fixing it up. So that's some examples of, of the kinds of tools we have and the, mainly the mindsets I'd like you to think about. Now, within that, there are two main things that can go wrong. And that's really the punchline of what I really want to talk to you about this morning. And they are, one is using excuses and calling them reasons. So we use excuses and we rationalize it by something we call reason. And the second thing that can go wrong is we mix up the concept of trying to do something and actually doing something. And that's sort of the subtitle of my talk today. So let's delve into these two things. So the first thing is I categorically state to you reasons are bullshit. And by that, I mean reasons for human behavior. Any reason you give for your own behavior is bullshit. I must tell you, I showed this slide to uh, some woman I know who's sort of from the old world, and she's a very gentle person. And she looked at it, and she said, oh, what a horrible word. And I said, yeah, reasons is a horrible word. <laughs> Well, that's not what she meant, but that's what I do mean, okay? So what do, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean you, you can't possibly know uh, the reasons for your behavior. And, but you need to have them. If someone says to you, why did you do something? If I say I don't know, I'm not a reasonable person. So you need reasons to, to seem like you're a reasonable person. But in fact, they're not useful. And the truth is, it's usually simply an excuse for something dysfunctional. So for example, uh, my mouth is a little dry right now. Uh, so if you ask me, Bernie, why is your mouth dry? I'd say, well, I'm talking so much. I'm lecturing, right? That's a no-brainer. But what I haven't told you is that uh, I haven't eaten anything this morning at all. I haven't told you that last night I drank a bottle of wine. I haven't told you I am always dehydrated. My wife's always yelling at me to drink water. And I haven't told you a lot of other things which I'm embarrassed to tell you about, OK? So what Bernie has done is he's picked the one thing which seems to make sense, that I'm talking to you, and that's why I'm dry. And it makes me cool. I'm a professor and all that and all that stuff. I don't tell you all the other things. Now, that same truth is the case for everything you do. 
There's a million reasons for anything you've done. It goes back to your childhood and maybe even before that. And you don't know the the reason you've done something. So the minute you tell me the reason, it's a lie. Now, it's usually a little white lie, and it's something that's fine. No one cares. Who cares? And it's usually, if you have an image of yourself as a good person, it's something that makes you look good. If you have an image of yourself as a badass, it's usually something that makes you look bad. You know? So whatever image you want, you can project by selecting that reason. But the point simply is, it's always just something you have selected. It's not really why you do it. You, don't, you know what you've done. If you're awake and you're mindful, you know what you've done. Beyond that, you don't know. Okay, so by selecting it, it's, it's, it's biasing the situation. And it's fine, most of the time it doesn't matter. But sometimes reasons are simply excuses for acting in a way that is dysfunctional. And if you're acting in a dysfunctional way, you can change that if you want to. So the idea is simply to be aware of that and just do what you do and don't explain it. Do what you do and just take responsibility for what you do. And if you do not like what you do or did not do, don't do it again. Now, that's more easily said than done. So the truth is, if I do something and I give you a bullshit reason for it, I'm being nice to you, I'm giving you a reason, but in my mind, I say, you know, I don't want to do that again. Now, I will do it again. But eventually, if I do it enough times, I'll stop doing it. If every time I do that, I notice, look, I don't want to, why did I say that? I don't want to do that. That's not really what happened. I will change my behavior. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as being mindful and having the intention to change and giving it the attention it needs. So it's really important to understand that most reasons get in your way. And we, we have a joke about it where I work. We call it a good reason, meaning it's a bullshit reason. And uh, if you can learn to get rid of reasons and not use them, uh, you, you'll go a long way. Another thing I want to talk to you about is trying. And trying is not the same as doing. Uh, now, there's something about it that's a little unfortunate, and I hate to uh, get and say Yoda was wrong because I might be struck down just sitting here, but I'm going to tempt it. Uh, I think really it's, and I, I understand what it's about in the movie and the Star Wars, and it's great where it is, and everyone loves it, and it's sticky, and that's fine. But people love using the, the Star Wars I quote of Yoda, there's no try, there's only do. And I understand it, but it's, it's a kind of too type A for most people to live with and stuff like that. I think you're much better off, as I believe, that there is a try and there is a do. The, the only problem is that they, and they're both okay. They're both okay. And that's, I think, something you have to think about. But if you're trying, then you may or may not accomplish what you have in mind. Okay? That's, the, that's what I call a trying state. If I'm in a trying state, it might or might work. It might work. It might work out. It might not work out. But if I'm doing, then if I encounter an obstacle, uh, I mean, I, if I'm trying, if I encounter an obstacle, I, I can be stopped. I can be stopped. Well, if I'm doing, I will accomplish what I have in mind regardless, the obstacles will not stop me. They are both okay states. The difficulty comes when you think they are the same thing, okay? Now, let me just give you a personal anecdote in my life that just nailed it for me so well. I was driving in San Francisco with my wife, and I noticed there's a theater there called the Roxy Theater, which is a kind of uh, funky little theater that shows movies you don't see anywhere else. And we were driving by, and there was this huge line, the largest line I've ever seen in front of that theater. And uh, it was a movie about a band, and it turns out the band was there too. I had never heard of them, but I thought, oh, this could be really interesting. So I suggested to my wife we stop, and she said, no, no, I'm tired, let's go home. We had a back and forth, and eventually she acquiesced, and she said, okay, let's go. So I said, okay, you get out, buy the tickets, and I'll go find a parking place. So I went, and about 10 minutes later, I came back, having found the parking place, and she was standing not in line. And I said, well, why are you not in line? And she said, I, they were sold out. I said, yes. And she said, well, they were sold out. I couldn't get tickets. I said, you, you couldn't. I don't understand. Why didn't you get these? They were sold out. So I said, stay here. And then five or ten minutes, I had two tickets. 
And we went in and we saw the show, and my wife was right as usual. We shouldn't have gone. It was awful. But the point simply is my wife was trying. She was trying to appease me. She was trying to be nice about it. She really wasn't going to be doing in terms of going to the show. So she got an obstacle. They were sold out. It was absolutely true. She wasn't lying. They were sold out. Once she hit that obstacle, she stopped trying. It was over. She wasn't doing. Okay? I was going to do no matter what. So it wasn't too heroic. I would have been more heroic, but it turned out to be pretty easy. I walked up and down the line. I asked if anyone had any extra tickets, and someone had just been called by a friend who said they weren't coming, so he sold me her ticket. And then as I was walking around, some guy was walking to the box office wanting to return a ticket, and I bought it from him. But even if it wasn't that easy, there is some amount of money where someone in the mission district would sell me tickets. Okay, and if I were going to do, and no matter what, I would come up with that amount of money. And it's as simple as that. It's as simple of whatever it takes. I've been at the airport where they tell me uh, a flight is canceled to somewhere. If I don't want to actually go on that trip, if I'm going because I should or I have to, I'm elated. I'm blocked. I tried. I go into the airport. This is no, so this is an actual true story. But if I were really doing, you know, there are ways of getting there even though the plane isn't flying there. And if my life depended on it, I would get there. So it's a simple example of this whole idea of the difference between trying and doing. And it's a lot of fun to try. I'm not against it. A lot of times I try, and it, 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 it's just to, to realize they're not the same thing. So it can be fun to try and not succeed. You don't always have to succeed. I love, I love to lose sometimes. I, you know, some people go crazy if they lose. I love to lose. I actually, uh, in social things with friends, you know, I love to play Scrabble and worry about drinking rather than winning the Scrabble game. And I have friends who just want to win the Scrabble game. And, all, and I enjoy the whole show. You know, it doesn't bother me at all. Maybe you are different than me. You know. But uh, you just have to not kid yourself that someone else has stopped you. You just need to realize that if you do not succeed, you choose to be trying rather than doing. That's the key to the whole thing, and I think that's the way you should look at it. And at times, it's better to try and not succeed than it is to succeed. And it might even save your life at times. So sometimes succeeding can get you into a lot of trouble. So just be careful what you ask for, and I would say mellow out and don't, you don't have to be Yoda all the time. But when you want to be, don't use excuses, and don't let yourself off the hook. And you have to know your intention. What is my intention? What is I want to accomplish? What do I want to do? And if you're going to do it, you have to give it attention. It requires time. Those guys who did the embrace, that children sleeping there, it took years of hard work, even though they had a brilliant idea. The brilliant idea may work right away. In general, it's not. It's going to be commitment. It's going to be doing hard work as a part of creativity. It's one of the most important parts of it. If you read the stories about these big achievers like Steve Jobs or Elon Musk, these guys never sleep. I mean, they're working all the time. They're not kicking back and smoking cigars and all that. Uh, there's a different type of personality, a different type of DNA. You don't have to be that extreme, but you have to be the appropriate DNA for what you choose to do to have a good life. So when you, the thing to realize, I've come to realize, when you try, you're using force. And when you do, you're using power. And in life, it is much better to be powerful than to be forceful. And if you think about that, it's that way. It's not the, this yanking back and forth when you're trying to do something. If you do it, you knock your opponent on their backside without much effort. If you're efforting, it's a trying thing. You might succeed. You might not succeed. But if someone is powerful, there's no... There's no doubt what they're going to do. And if you see that around you, it, it, it's just awesome. And that's kind of the behavior you want to do. And I just got this letter, July 3rd, which is not far away. This is, she wrote it. It was written on the 3rd, so I got it. it was, this is a snail mail letter from a woman who is uh, in her 80s who used to be a professor of a university, okay? So she's an accomplished woman. And she read my book, and she wrote me this story. And the story is, uh, she said, my, they were, her husband was a professor, and she couldn't get a job. Of course, in those days, there was nepotism and discrimination. Again, it, was, it goes way back before she even got her first teaching. My husband, I'll take out the identified, needed a freshly washed and ironed white dress shirt every morning. 
Ironing his shirt came to symbolize my circumscribed life. And then she goes on to recount the dream she had, where she's out in the Midwest in these flowing fields and the open spaces and everything like that, but she was chained up and couldn't go and move anything. And she wrote, then she writes, writing about this dream in my daily journal, I recognized Kafka's prisoner, who was confined only in, by his own choice. The insight came, everything we do, we have chosen to do by default or decision. And that was her insight years ago, which led ultimately to becoming a president of a pretty big college and all that. So it's just, it, and I think that's really a powerful thing to realize that you're in charge, folks, you know what I mean? And you could do or not do, it doesn't matter. It's okay, but it should just serve your function. And you don't have to be a college president. You could be a college janitor. You could not even know what a college is. It doesn't matter. It's just whatever will serve your life is where you want to get to, and you don't want to have dysfunctional behaviors and excuses and reasons can be dysfunctional, and I just would like you to be aware of that. And you don't have to be as extreme as me. I do not use reasons. I do not give everyone reasons. I just had another example of that uh, this morning. Uh, I get I get endless requests from students that want to come and do PhDs with me from all over the world. And what I used to do is give them reasons, and I'd get a lot of pushback, and oh, my, my, I, if I said I didn't have money, oh, I have a rich uncle, it goes on and on, and it was endless emails. Now I've gotten this thing, I don't give reasons. I say, I'm sorry, I can't help you, good luck to you. And this, I just did it a day ago, and this morning I got what I usually get. Thank you, professor, for answering my email. That's the end of the conversation. I get, I get the, I either neither hear from them again, or I get thank you for answering my email. And that's fine, I'm happy with that. And it's so functional for me, and it just clears the air, and it doesn't get their expectations up and stuff like that. And any reason I give a student for not taking this bullshit, because if I wanted to take a student, I could take them no matter what. So it's just a lie. I just, for some reason, which I don't know, or for a thousand reasons, not doing it. Just say what you're gonna do. Try it out and see how that works for you. So the other thing is language is kind of important. And what you have to do, what you have to do with language is be a little careful. And in my book, I talk a lot about it. I just want to mention certain obvious things. So if you say you have to, it's disempowering. If you have to do something and someone's making you do it, you know. but if you say I want to, it's really empowering. And the truth is you do. As, as this woman said in her letter to me, uh, everything you're doing, you're choosing to do it either by electing to do it or by electing not to do it. So if you're going to do it, you really want to do it. Well, you know, maybe all sorts of reasons. It doesn't matter. You're doing it. So you want to do it. And if you don't want to do it, don't do it. It's a simple. And that kind of simple change of phrase is very empowering. I can't. I can't do it. I won't do it. Again, it's much more empowering to say you won't do it than I can't do it. Can't do it is a wimp out thing and it disempowers you. And the other word, is, I have many more, but the other one I love is, is the use of but versus and. So most of the time in our language you use but, uh, like I'd like to stop talking, I'd like to keep talking to you, uh, but my time is up, I might say. And it's the existential situations, I like to keep talking to you and my time is up. So there's no, those are two things which are existentially true. So we usually take two phrases which are existentially true, we combine them with the but, and it nullifies the thing. I remember I was in Tokyo, and I gave this wonderful talk, and someone gets up in the audience at the end, he says, Bernie, that was a wonderful talk, but, ba 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 ba. And the but is, of course, negates that, that he thought it was a wonderful talk, you know. And he, it isn't that he was being uh, nasty to me, it's just the way people use language. But if he said, Bernie, that was a wonderful talk, and it would, I would have felt much better about it. Okay, you get the idea. Okay, so we, I would like to keep talking to you, and we're now at the point where Ryan is going to talk to you for a bit, and after that, we're going to take questions for you guys, but before I do that, I want to just make sure you understand the point of it. I want you to make sure that you make sure you're working on a real problem and disappear it if you can. Don't use reasons for your behavior. Just notice what you've done and take responsibility for it. And if your attention is to do, do it. Don't try to do it. And then after that, I want to also tell you about my book. 
which is called the Achievement Habit, which is, this is the front cover. And if you're interested, I have a really nice website about it, called, which is essentially achievementhabit, one word, dot com. And it came out just about two weeks ago from HarperCollins, and you can get it any way you want, hopefully. And it does a lot of the things I talked about here. So thanks for everyone for listening and being out there, and I hope you have a good rest of the day.